Hello and welcome to a solo playthrough of the Fisher's Hill battle scenario, part of Death Valley um, Battles of Shenandoah by GMT Games. Game designer Greg Lautback. Apologies for not being doing a lot of solo playthroughs for a little while. Um, space issues uh, have been uh, a problem, but um, we'll see if we can get back into them. So the uh, the Death Valley. Battles of the Shandoah game is part of the Great Battles of the American Civil War series. So this was originally designed by Richard Berg, the late Richard Berg, and uh, I believe the first in its uh, inceptions was uh, way back when with Terrible Swift Sword, the Gettysburg game, which I did actually have for a while. And uh, it's been polished and honed and there's been a lot of different uh, uh, battles and series of battles uh, produced and um, this is kind of the latest one. The reason I like this particular one is that it's uh, it's got a lot of battles in it from the 1862 and the 1864 Shenandoah campaigns. 1862 focuses on the Stonewall Jackson's campaign, Valley campaign, and the 1864 on uh, Sheridan's uh, campaign for the Union. What it also is very good at is giving you alternative starts or alternative free setups for each of the battles as well, so it's not just one battle at a time. But it still uses this GBACW system, uh, and it's at uh, the regiment level, maybe a bit below in, in on occasion. And uh, the emphasis here is quite a bit on command control. There are uh, brigade, the division, uh, corps, and army leaders, and they need to be in, you know, they have a command, each have a command range and they command um, their subordinates and all the way down to the brigade leaders which manage the regiments. There's a, not a very um, complicated order system as well involved um, to uh, be able to do certain things with, with your regiments. But anyway, that's, uh, that's the sort of overview of uh, the game and let's have a look at some of the components and how it all works. So going through the intro on uh, this game, Death Valley, and um, it is of course a part of the uh, series uh, from GMT of Great Battles of the American Civil War, um, the latest incarnation as time of uh, filming here. And uh, starting with Ter Terrible Swiss Sword, as I said before, and a few other titles over the period. Normally, first thing I kind of do is talk about the rhythm of the game and then including the sequence of play. So so the game is chip uh, pull based. It's uh, almost entire turn is chip pulling. There's a command phase uh, at the start uh, with uh, working out orders and activation levels. And then you have an activation segment where it's chip pulling. Uh, and each individual brigade in each army will chit uh, from one to four chits uh, available depending on their command capability, their divisional command capability, their core capability. Um, all those leaders feed into how many activations they get between one and four. We pull them out of a cup and then that's the, uh, once that's over, that's... 90, 99% of the turnover. Then there's a couple of other segments, but we'll go through that. One thing I would say about the this particular game, I'm not sure if it's in the others because I don't actually own the others, but there is no actual sequence of play on a card, in a, an A card or anything like that. It's just in a uh, rule book, which is why I've got the rule book in, in front here. And it's actually in the series rule book as well. Um, so you need to keep the rule book handy until you've really got the sequence of play down pat and not problem really in the activation segment you kind of know what's going on there on the command segment though there's a certain order you do things which you can easily get confused on doing things before you should do other things and i think actually when you're playing the game it's not a hundred percent important some of that sequence as well you could they, they some have sometimes have nothing much to do with the other so you can kind of um you know sort of mix and match anyway as you're playing but let's go through the um uh, the sequence of play uh, inside and it's not on the first page either so um the sequence of play here is actually on um so yeah we have 
an initiative orders an order segment. That's why I call it, kind of call the command segment there. Uh, initiative segment is basically a dice roll. That's all it is. Uh, order segment, uh, you determine your chain of command. And this is where you measure in command points between your core leaders, your division leaders, and your uh, brigade leaders, uh, uh, all forming chains of command, like a great kind of tree structure. Then you work out what's known as the efficiency. So this is the number of activations that a particular formation can have. You decide uh, efficiency markers for each of your core. So a core command level, you'll pick a chit for uh, each of those. From that, you work out when, what about the division markers you're going to receive. So you've got your bare number, and of course, actually, in a chip pull game, the efficiency number is determined by a chip pull. So each particular battle you're running, you will get a set of chits that you would put into a cup each turn and then draw out for each core what's the base efficiency number. That base efficiency number is then modified by the capabilities of the core commander, their command rating, also capabilities of uh, the division commanders can have an effect on that as well, plus whether the chain of command is actually complete. So if you have a core of, say, three divisions, if one division is out of command, as in the chain of command, your command radius from your core command to the division commander is out, then they are out of command and they activate, their efficiency number is effectively one less. This can also happen to brigades when they're out of command from their division they will activate one less than their division would. That's where you determine the efficiency here. You do it for both sides in secret and it's off on a chart. You then determine division orders. Division orders are one of four, particularly in this game, normally one of three. There's a fourth order that comes in here as well. So um, the kind of catch-all order is known as advance. That means you can move and or fire. You have the attack order, which you can move but only half your movement for each unit each regiment that's moving you can fire and you can also do shock combat assault combat as well the final one is known as march and march is kind of your strategic movement and this this is for units which are reinforcements usually or something where you, uh, some units which you want to get from one end of the board kind of to the other so they do a kind of independent move of what's going on in the battle and is subject to chip pulls of the march chip pull not of the chip pull for the actual formation the fourth one is known as open order and this only exists in the 1864 scenarios of uh, the great battles of americans of war so this is that's it's actually only relevant for half this game and i believe not relevant for any of the other games and that's kind of a half attack half advance order with some defensive capabilities and represents uh, effectively rather than having everybody lined up you know shoulder to shoulder uh in columns or uh or line is actually a more, more spread out formation for defensive purposes so orders are actually applied to brigades um you have a chain of command uh, from brigade leaders all the way up to core commanders you can at the start of the turn set a particular order for each of those formations um, so that's the transmission of orders uh, down the chain onto the brigades there is another way of dealing with orders and that's to do with the activation segment this is kind of the, the big um, per turn uh, setting and uh, in this you can usually switch between whichever one you want as long as you've got that chain of command you can also assign orders to reinforcements usually something like a march to come in. There is actually another order you can set known as reserve and this is effectively a rest and recuperation order which uh, units have to be, um, your units have to be far enough away from the uh, the enemy uh, and then you can recover what's known as um, effectiveness, combat effectiveness levels. At the end of that order segment you can order for engineering works to begin so creating breastworks, uh, defensive uh, markers can be built and that takes some time, it's, uh, it's over a couple, of, uh, a, couple, uh, a couple of activations that that happens. So then we have the activation segment. Now the particularly important thing about the active, uh, activation segment, because we did that die roll at the beginning with the initiative segment, uh, D10 each. Uh, you modify that with the initiative rating of your 
Supreme Commander, so it's the Army Commander. As long as they are in contact with at least one Court Commander, you can use that. Um, so they're involved in the order setting of the battle, if, if you like. They can provide that, uh, that bonus. Also, whichever side or whichever Commander had the initiative last turn gets a plus one. But it's on a D10, so it's quite a widespread, so you can get changes quite happily. In fact, the initiative rating for the Army Commander can be used in the order segment to boost the efficiency rating of a core commander within range. So uh, the, the actual rating has a double usage. Uh, but actually, at the activation segment, this is where initiative comes in. So uh, what you do is you pick one of your chits for one of your formations, i.e. A, a, a division. Um, the chits are by division, not by brigade. And um, that will be the first activated unit in the battle. So the initiative player gets that luxury. All the others are just placed in the cup and randomly picked. And once you've chosen what the initiative will be, everything's put into, the, into a cup, if you like, all the other uh, relevant activation markers are put into a cup. And after that initial activation, you'll then be pulling chits out of the cup at random. And then you have the core of the turn, which is activation. So uh, you pull out a chit, um, that's to a particular division, and you decide what you what you do. So, um, first thing, you can do nothing. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. If you activate too many times in a turn, you will accumulate fatigue, and this will start to affect your troops. Initially, it's you, you kind of have a bit of a, a buffer of a couple of fatigue instances where it's not really going to affect you, but then it starts to affect the morale of the units and the capabilities of the units. You, you can, of course, activate them as, as well. And if you do activate them, then you firstly have the ability to try and change your orders. So in down at the brigade level, you can say, well, look, I'd like this brigade, even though the division, uh, the, the, the orders it was given was to advance, I'd like it to attack. And then you have to roll a dice to see what, what happens um, and whether, you know, whether the orders can change. And this is not a given and you can get bad results. You can get what's known as stand, which is the unit doesn't actually do anything. It might change its orders, it might retain its orders, and it doesn't change, and in both cases, it might just sit there and do nothing for the activation, but it's still activated. Um, so that's, that's a really bad thing. Or you could get, of course, the change happening, or you could get it to say, well, I'm, I'm, I'm just doing what I did before. Um, particularly when you're maneuvering around the battle, the change between act, uh, attack and advance is quite important because advance you get to move your full, full movement allowance. Uh, attack um, you only get half, and it, it tends to be quite significant if you're not really that near the the enemy. Um, so you have that change orders, then you may what's known as coordinate your brigades. I must admit I haven't seen a huge amount of usefulness for it. Effectively, if you've got a division with two or three brigades, you can roll, modified by the, how good the, the, the division commander is, to actually get all those brigades to actually activate together rather than one at a time, which is what you, you will do in the, act, in the action phase. You'll get to the action phase, and depending on the orders, of course, you can do, um, you can do your move. So there's your standard bit of the move, which is you can move or fire and fire plus shock, depending on what your orders are. After you've fired and moved, you can then do your shock combat. You can do a thing called resupply ammo. Generally what it is, is if you roll a modified five on the combat table, that unit will be on low ammo, give them a minus two fire uh, rating. If they do it again and roll another modified five, they'll be out of ammo and they can't fire. And a resupply ammo, means that you don't do any of the um, move, fire, shock kind of stuff. You just downgrade that marker or remove that marker as it is. And the final thing you can do is you can const do construction. So you can uh, uh, construct the, the, the breastwork construction that you started in the engineering phase. Once you've done that, with that brigade, you move on to the next brigade and to the next brigade until you've completed all the brigades on the division, whether you do something for them or not, and then you go to the next chit and it goes on and on and on and on like, until, of course, you run out of chits and everybody's activated as much as they want and used up their chits either. You have an end of turn segment. At that point, you get to move commanders. So this is the core commanders and the army commanders. And this is so you can set the, uh, the chain of command for next turn. It's your 
uh, move so they can move up or move across or whatever where they need to be to then be able to keep that chain of command going then you have a replacement uh, recovery phase if leaders are, uh, have, have been killed uh, through fire or shock you can replace them and then in reserve units who don't really activate for the turn they kind of sit there then have the ability to recover and then you can also come out of reserve at this point uh, as well uh, there is a bit about artillery when artillery is overrun it becomes abandoned and if it's abandoned for too long for two two consecutive um, uh, turns uh, hours if you like then they are effectively destroyed they're removed from the board they're effectively eliminated well you could reoccupy the hex with people who are from the side of that original gun battery and then you could activate it again um, and finally the construction marker finishing uh, when you when when you've done your construction for the turn you can finish the construction of breathworks one last thing is you check for what's known as combat effectiveness if you have a brigade if more than half of your regiments are either routed i.e they're off the board into a routed box um, they are collapsed as in they have they, they become combat ineffective themselves or they've been eliminated then the brigade becomes combat ineffective also, if all the units in the brigade are any of those three, plus if they're disordered, and disorder is a com uh, is a combat, uh, usually combat, sometimes movement, a um, status of the uh, a lower organisation status of the unit, then it can be combat effect ineffective as well, and you label it so. If more than half of the brigades of a division are like that, then the division is a combat ineffective and this affects command um, because you can't activate them more than twice in subsequent turns but you constantly measure it as you're going through each time at the end of a turn disordered units can reorder it that's quite a normal thing in the game so it might be a temporary uh, a problem unless it's about being routed and eliminated have and then you're kind of stuck with it but they become much less capable in the game once it's combat ineffective we turn the turn marker, which is an hourly turn, to the next turn, and then we go back to the initiative segment again. So that's the sequence of play, and you've got a number of hourly turns in the battle, and at the end of that, you've got victory points, etc. Uh, so that's the sequence of play there, and I kind of talk through kind of what you do in each of the cases. So next, um, we'll have a look at uh, the counters. So looking at the uh, the core of any game, which is of course the units, uh, we've got just a selection here of the actual combat units here. Uh, we have infantry, cavalry, and artillery here samples. So um, everybody has the same basic format. So we have a unit designation, also a higher command designation, uh, and the type of unit it is. So we have infantry here, we have cavalry here, but also here, this is dismounted cavalry. So this is uh, effectively the same unit in two different forms. Uh, and then finally, the artillery here, I think, with the gun symbols as well. Uh, now, um, also, they may move in position, except for the basic three numbers. Pretty much, you've got uh, the three classic numbers at the bottom of the counter. First one is number of steps. So not necessarily a fire rating, Although it potentially is, usually there's a limit on how much, uh, how many strength points you can fire out of a hex. Usually seven. So if you have six there, you'll be firing all those steps. Um, but if you had say uh, an eleven or a twelve back to unit, which is a step unit, which is possible in the game, there's quite a lot of them. Uh, you would still only fire seven. So it's not quite a fire rating, but it is. Uh, what's known as a, a step a step rating, how big the unit is. Uh, the last number is its movement. You can see they vary, four, five, some here. Uh, you have eights and tens for artillery. Uh, that's horse artillery, which is why the, the number's a little bit different. Uh, and of course, cavalry is higher when they're on horseback. The middle guy though, the middle number there, is the effectiveness level, combat effectiveness level. So kind of like a morale or a proficiency. Uh, rating and uh, higher the better of course and it's uh, something you will roll against uh, usually for morale checks if you've taken a loss or the combat table tell you to uh, to check whether you disorder and when you disorder you will actually flip over 
and this is the disordered version. So you'd usually be slower. Um, the efficiency rating is one less. Uh, steps is the same though, of course, and you have this little D in a yellow circle. If you are disordered again, depending on what made you disorder, something bad will happen to you. And it's a, there's a chart that we'll go through to have, have a look at that briefly. The final thing we haven't talked about here, let's flip that one back up, is the little uh, letter in uh, or set of letters in the uh, in the black circle and that's the weapon type so you can see here on the infantry here they're all R's which stands for rifle standard standard rifle there are muskets in the game uh, and in the game series there's quite a lot of things like old rifles uh, I've even seen shotguns would you believe um, here on the uh, cavalry we've got something different here we've got a BC and that stands for breech carbine when you're firing those weapons, depending on the range, you will get modifiers, and it's really dependent on, on the type of weapon you use, how effective they are at what range. Particularly with the artillery, this is relevant, because their artillery have a different um, set of uh, weapon types, which are, uh, there's I think there's about seven of them, which have that characteristic, and of course the range is quite a big thing actually, so um, usually the small arms, which is what they called, which is what rifles, breech, car, uh, breech carbines, uh, etc. are, they have a very finite, maybe up to five hexes if you're lucky, uh, whereas um, the artillery of course can range quite, a, quite, quite far. Um, and um, so there's six, so this is uh, three inch rifles, the TBs, that's a 12 inch howitzer, a 12 pound howitzer, sorry, and that's a 10 pound parrot. Uh, unit. Uh, they still have the same proficiency rating. Note their steps are in brackets and that's because that's the number of guns not the number of steps in the regiment. It's a battery so it's the number of guns and you you actually fire by guns as opposed to steps when you're firing artillery. So that's uh, that's the basic uh, unit in the game that you'll fire with. Beyond that, you'll have informational counters, chits for picking activations, of course, and of course, the commanders. Right, well, here we have the commanders. So we've got four ranks here, which is denoted by the stars. So four stars are army commanders. Here we have Sheridan and Early for the two sides. Top row is the Confederates. Union is the bottom row here. So looking at the armed commanders first, they really have only two ratings here, other than you know the number of stars. Uh, first is the initiative rating. So this is the modifier on the dice roll at the start of each turn. And then the next number, which is actually synonymous with all the other commanders, is their command range. So that's not in hexes, that's in leader movement points. Now before everybody goes, oh God, I'm gonna have to count uh, move, uh, leader movement points and stuff. It's easier than you think. So rather than hexes, pretty much every hex is one movement point, except for roads, which is halved, and difficult terrain like woods is two. So it's not that difficult to get used to uh, counting the chain of command hexes from leaders to leaders. Um, and of course, there isn't necessarily a relationship between the army commander and the corps commanders, uh, because uh, the efficiency ratings are dealt with here uh, and also the chain of command is important for out of command from the core commander down uh, the army kind of only really gets involved if they're within uh, if they're within range of a core commander they can lend their initiative rating to the core commander so that's army commanders done then we drop a star and we've got the um we've got the core commanders here so three stars again only two ratings here um, so, uh, and our black um, circled white number is of course, is command range. We were only really worried about one number. And that number here is an efficiency rating. So this means uh, how well does the commander boost the efficiency chit you picked for the core. So if you picked out a two uh, for each of these, Sigil would not make that a three, but Breckenridge would. And that's where those numbers come in. Now, next we have our division commanders. And again, we have our command range. And we now have two stars, of course. One thing I would point out, which is relevant here, is that that's actually the same person. Uh, what you have is that some of the battles within Death Valley are quite small. And on the Confederate size, where they worked with big divisions, 
you will actually only have a division on the uh, uh, Confederate side. So effectively one division is a corps. And so therefore you need a corps commander, but there wasn't a corps commander, there was just the division commander. Effectively they're combined and you actually have two counters for the same personality. So here Breckenridge here is both a division commander and a corps commander and you kind of keep the counters together that you stack them they don't move apart um, but you use them in the same way as you would a corps commander and a division commander it doesn't really happen on the union side uh, so on the division commanders here we've got the two stars of course and the designations you start to get the designations so this is the first division of the army of west virginia uh, black circled number command range as you can see they start to drop these numbers they get lower and lower um, sometimes not in the case you can see sigils here sigil uh, here is a, a five this is a, a six um, uh, but usually they drop it's just that sigil is not a very good core commander uh, shields is a pretty good division commander um, and then we have the two ratings either side the boxed rating and the unboxed now the Unboxed is the Brigade co Coordination um, rating. So this is a modifier on the table URL for Brigade Coordination. That was getting several brigades working at the same time. So you move them together as if they were one big brigade and fight, etc. Again, I, I said I don't really use that very. I don't see a huge point to it. Uh, in fact, sometimes it's, it's positively a good idea to... Uh, echelon your brigades so one goes in and fights and then the other comes in and fights so anyway that's that rating and then the bottom rating is what's known as the activation uh, rating so the activation rating is kind of like the efficiency rating call command but it's only for that division so um, when I said right a call commander picks out say a two efficiency chip uh, uh, rating chit um, and makes it, uh, say Breckenridge makes it a three. What the a division can do is that they can use that rating to up it again for that particular division. So not the whole core, but this their division. So theoretically here, you could have Breckenridge as the core commander, ordering Breckenridge, the division commander, getting um, uh, a, a effectively a plus one for the efficiency rating and then also a plus one for the uh, all, uh the activation rating and that doesn't actually happen you if it's the same person you can use one or you can use the other but uh you get the idea here we've got zero and zero so there's no there's no change here so if that if it was two efficiency uh sigil wouldn't help shields wouldn't help his own division either so that means that you can get a different number of activation markers down per division uh, in, in in your activation cup. So that's uh, that's division commanders. And finally on to the brigade commanders, down to the one star guys, who are gonna be mostly in the front line fighting things. And uh, they have again three ratings. And note the color coding here. Now there's a color bar that appears here, um, which is matched with the efficiency rating of of the combat unit so that's a white box and you match it with a white um, marker it's effectively doing the same thing as the the little designation here but it's a lot easier on a battlefield map if you can see these colors rather than squinting down to the the, the little ratings um, and then we've got our three values now uh, it seems to be standard now and of course the one in the middle is the command range and that is the command rate range two individual regiments so that's actually to the units themselves um, the other two we have what's known as an action profile at the top and the action profile is relevant for brigade orders change so when you can change it attempt to change an order if you get a particular result on the orders change table you get what's known as a loose cannon and that means that the depending on the action profile of the brigade commander, he might do one of different things. And usually those action profiles are normal, which is an N here, and also here. You might have an A, which is aggressive, or you might have a C, which is cautious. And that basically tells you what will happen in the case of a loose cannon. Uh, these are normal ones, which means nothing special will happen. Um, pretty much they'll just sit there and not do much. Then the last rating here 
is known as the orders rating. That's kind of in the same ballpark as the action profile. So when you want to change orders, they've got a bonus to the dice roll. Uh, these can be negative, and so uh, the smaller the roll, the less likely they are to do is not to do what you want. And the, the, the orders rating boosts the capability of the brigade um, leader actually follow, following their own initiative and actually doing the right thing. Uh, and each of these have a replacement side. So the leaders can become casualties. If, if they're in a, in a hex which takes uh, a step loss or in a shot combat, um, you need to roll a dice on a zero they are a casualty, so they're removed from the board and they're replaced by uh, the person underneath. And this may actually um, set up a kind of um, cascade effect where this person, Kimball, if uh, Shields is, is a casualty, will take over the division job, but he probably had a brigade. And then that brigade needs to be, that, that brigade leader, Kimball, needs to be replaced by kind of a generic uh, on the back counter. Uh, the number of stars is a modifier for effectiveness checks dice rolls in units in the same hex. So things like rallying or not disordering, um, they're very, very useful, but of course they're vulnerable and you wanna be a bit careful with them. So that's our commander counters. Let's look at some of the uh, other counters in the game. Right, so these are the markers. Uh, let's um, let's take the top here. These are the efficiency chits. Uh, pick out what how many activations a core is going to have for the turn as a base number. Uh, range from one to four. Uh, here's a Union one. Here's a Confederate one here. Uh, next, let's look down here. These are the actual activation chits themselves. They've got a blank back. Uh, blue for Union, red for Confederate. And they will have... Uh, the command, the division commander's name on it, um, also the designation of the division as well as part of the whole army, uh, and also color coded. So again, that color bar that we saw uh, with the brigade, uh, the division leaders' shields here. So as you can see, that number and that color and that color um, work together. And the colours are really what you use for designation here. It's all a lot of small writing. Uh, we have our low ammo counter, uh, which if we flip over, we have the out of ammo counter, which you designate a unit if they've used their ammo up. Uh, the out of command uh, counter as well. And then here we have the orders. Uh, so this, you put it pretty much on top of or near to the brigade commander of what the orders are. Uh, you'll note, uh, open order here as well, you'll note there isn't an advance um, counter. There, there is actually an advance counter. There's not very many of them because uh, the convention in the game is if you're going to have an advance order for a unit, you don't put a marker down. It's the default is, is, is advanced. Then we have our fatigue counters here, which again, you stack with the brigade. You do it at the brigade level. Uh, and you start off with an, a fatigue counter no fatigue counter so you're fresh if you like but there's no marker for fresh um, if you suffer from one fatigue um, you'll go to what's known as okay fatigue if you have another one you will go to a zero fatigue uh, then you from there you'll move to a one a two a three and then finally to a four uh, and you will get these if you activate uh, three times in uh, an activation segment. So you have three chits and you do choose to do something on all three. You will gain a fatigue for the brigade. Also, if you're involved in more than one shot combat, you will gain the brigade a fatigue as, as well. So fatigue is optional in the game. However, within Death Valley, it suggests that fatigue is mandatory. Uh, and I think it's actually a very good mechanic. So what does it do? So the number is the important part. So OK means nothing. Uh, zero means nothing as well, really. It's just another step. Uh, when we get to one, things start having an effect. So uh, first thing that happens is you subtract half that number, rounding up, from your movement allowance of the unit. There's a modifier to shock, negative modifier to shock, and also to fire rolls. So you'll be firing less effectively as well. Also, if you're doing an effectiveness check, you check you know, like a morale check against that middle number on the counter, then again, half the fatigue level rounded up, 
becomes a negative modifier. The shock resolution when defending, again, you'll get a negative there. And what's known as pre-shock check rolls. So do the unit, when they're subject to um, a unit coming at them and attacking them by shock, do the guys, are, are the guys able to stand and fight? And then all rally attempts. So when you're disordered, coming back from disorder, again, you, uh, you need to, uh, you'll get a negative amount. So you can imagine that a fatigue of four, that's two, a minus two on all those things. If you're at fatigue four, you've got a lot of restrictions as well. You can't, at, can't change to attack orders, for example. You can't even do a march order either. All you can do is advance. So moving on, we've got our standard strength point marker. So when a unit has taken a casualty, say this one here, so there's six strength points. This is then reduced by, by one to five by putting a five marker underneath. Further over here, we have the collapsed unit, and then you have the combat ineffective. So the collapsed unit is when um, the unit has taken more than half casualties. The combat effective division, uh, there's a combat effective, ineffective brigade uh, marker as well uh, to place during that ineffect, uh, combat effectiveness check at the end of each turn uh, on the unit. And those stay until the next check, the next turn. Finally, when you have big units, depending on their formations, you may need to extend lines. So effectively you would put a marker next to it, either a line or a column. It's usually a column here is when you're doing a march, using a march along a road. Uh, you have to spread out a bit because it's a narrow column and there's a lot of people uh, involved and it's uh, effectively like a stacking variation here. So look at your charts and tables uh, and also the map here. Um, there's quite a lot of uh, uh, terrain choices here. Uh, may, we get down to here with the major hex types, clear and um, woods, etc. and orchard, it's kind of halfway. Rivers and streams, this is a river, that's a stream, um, and marsh. Uh, beyond that, we're talking about slopes, um, then gullies and ridges, which are kind of extreme slopes, if you like, and sloping ground. So this is uh, um, when you're getting into hills and things like that. Then you have three types of road and the railroad, which doesn't really do anything at all. And then towns, which is our last one. I'm not sure why the town isn't way up here, to be honest. It's, uh, down here, it's a bit difficult to, to spot it. So there's the breastworks, uh, which is the, uh, the, the constructed defense. Stone walls and earthworks and forts. Uh, then we have some bridges and fords here, a bit further on special cases of, of rivers. Uh, we have four movement cost rates here. Foot would be infantry and dismounted cavalry. Mounted cavalry would be this one, of course. Artillery, so you may have noticed that the artillery has bigger movement factors than the infantry. Um, and particularly on horse artillery, they seem to have the biggest of, of all the 10 movement factor. However, there their movement costs are much, much higher here. And certainly the uh, additions for things like slopes really, really slow them down. Uh, so that bigger number uh, is taken into account. And here we have the leader movement, which again is what you cost for command range. As I say here, mostly it's ones with uh, just one plus one for an upper steep slope and then halves for roads. So ones and halves, the only ch changes you have is woods and marsh. Uh, two and three, so it's fairly easy to. Then we have our combat effects, which is usually on uh, negative to the fire roll and shock, the same thing, negative to the shock roll as well. Uh, and then finally, there is line of sight, of course, because there's range on, uh, on, on, on weapon types. So whether there's a blocking terrain or not, uh, you've got a column here as well. And as you can see here, we've got the Battle of Cedar Creek map here. You've got a few examples here, and you can see the relief, the, the height is as dark, the darker green is lower, the yellow is the higher uh, level, and of course, you, you can see there's quite, quite, a, quite a range of heights in, in the game system. So, over the page here on the um, terrain effects chart is what's known as a second disorder table. Now, I mentioned that when you disorder, you flip a marker over. When it disorders again, once it's already 
fl uh, flipped over, then depending on what happened to it and what kind of unit it is, things happen to it. As a, usually it's either losing a strength point or a retreat, um, or you have to stop, or uh, possibly route here is another one. So um, you check on this chart when you get a second disorder uh, onto a unit um, and cross-reference what, what it was facing at the time and what unit type it is. So in addition to that card, there is a fold-out card here as a player aid here. And the front of it is all about the command uh, phases, the orders, uh, segments, etc. So, uh, and you know, uh, things about uh, effectiveness, etc. So here we have the rally table. So work out whether you can rally or not. You have the brigade orders change uh, and some modifiers. Uh, and you can either retain and stand uh, retain, loose cannon, change and stand, or change. Um, of course, the loose cannon result, you look on this table here, and you have, I forgot there was a fourth action profile, which is unreliable, which is could be anything. Uh, it's even probably worse than the others. Um, and you have the brigade coordination table, which you could do to coordinate more than one brigade in the division during an activation if you wanted to. Then if we open up, we get the main fire table uh, areas here. So stacking down here gives you the stacking limits per hex. Um, as they usually, uh, with March, you can only have seven infantry, like you can fire with only seven infantry um, when you're uh, in advance or attack orders. You can stack up to 15 strength points per hex with advance and attack orders. That's the non-phasing fire eligibility. So. There is a capability of like a defensive fire or, or, a, or an interrupt fire from the non-phasing side uh, when units do certain things like fire at them or move close to them that kind of or move across them or something like that so or move away so these are the instances of uh, non-phasing uh, fire eligibility uh, and here we have the range effects chart so the top here here we have the different weapon types for the infantry cavalry and this is for the artillery. Now you can see, you can see the range chain differences between the two sides. Here we have the main fire table. So small arms is normally just infantry, but it also is a table used for artillery firing within within one, two, or three hexes away, where it's used you know, where canister is used. So as you can see, the artillery seems to be a, not as lethal as a small arms table, but the artillery will use a small arms table at short range. Um, you, you effectively look at the strength points of the firing unit, either guns or strength, uh, or strength points, and you roll a d10, and these are, you cross index to see what the result is. Um, if there's a number, that's a, a unit loss, um, you could get a D, uh, capital D means an automatic disorder, a small D means you need to check. And you might have a plus or minus next to that, which is a modifier on that dice roll. Uh, so here, up here, we've got 3D. That would be an automatic disorder with three step losses in, in that instance there. Uh, five is our out of ammo line. And with artillery, you can do a thing called rapid fire. Uh, rapid fire means you can fire twice in a turn where normally you would only fire once. Um, but zeros and tens mean that if you roll those on mod, uh, when you're mod, when they're modified, uh, you will actually run out of ammunition directly. So we have a load of adjustments here. Now another thing with you know, a slight whinge I had about the sequence of play, this is another slight whinge here. Everything in the kitchen sink is listed here, which is great, but it's a little bit too brief. Uh, I'll give you an example here. So this one plus one for mass target um, so you'd think, well, if they're uh, above a certain number of strength points in the target hex, uh, you apply that. However, it only applies to artillery and only to artillery, which is firing at four or more hexes away. And the rationale is that if you're firing canister or small arms, you're hitting the front of the unit. So you're not hitting every, you haven't got the capability of hit every, everybody. Whereas if you're long range fire from artillery, your cannonballs are you know, going through uh, ranks of, of units and you could affect all units. Um, and you get this bonus, of course. So um, you have to take these with a little pinch of salt, whether they're apl immediately applicable, depending on you know what they're saying, that there may be other situations where they don't apply or do apply. You have to be a little bit careful there.
And finally, on the last side is the shock resolution. So there's a procedure, kind of like a sequence of play, of what you do for shock. Um, you designate the, um, the target, you have a, there's a shock counter. There's a retreat before shock option for the defender. Uh, then if the attacker is green, and that green is defined as the, um, the efficiency rating of the unit has a little G next to it, um, and you check whether they would actually fight. Then there's a cohesion check for the defender. If they're standing, they get to fire, and then you resolve shock. And you resolve shock by um, working, uh, working out an, uh, a modifier to a dice roll. And initially you check out the odds, then you have um, other adjustments here. You work out a modifier to this fairly straightforward chart here, uh, which is less from one and less than one from two, 10 or greater, which is usually um, attacker retreats, nothing happens, um, everybody loses a strength, a strength point, um, and then various defender retreats. Uh, now up here, what will also happen is that when you shock, you would get the defender to retreat in these, uh, these higher bands, uh, but as you advance, you may be forced to actually keep attacking. So if there's other units, other, other defending units adjacent, you can then attack them as well. Uh, so that's, uh, that's quite an interesting part, uh, part of shock. The other thing about shock is that once you've, the units have finished shocking, the attacking units, they are automatically disordered. Uh, and of course, if they become disordered from things like the, um, the uh, reaction fire or the combat, um, they will be disordered again. So you'd go back to that second disorder table uh, as, as, as well. So that's the shock um, resolution there as well. So I don't really want to go through too much more. I mean, look at the gameplay and pick it up. I don't, I don't want to go through every single line of the rules, etc. I'm trying to give you an idea of the rhythm of the game and sort of the important points here and the important mechanics. So... Um, Let's get on with the initial turn of Fisher's Hill.